the, at the Shriners Hospital. All right, would you turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to be starting in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her by uh, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Will you join with me in prayer? Father, as we have been in these verses for the last few weeks, we thank you that they are true, and that if we would choose to align ourselves with these, with what you speak to us about here, that not only would we, would we be able to taste and experience marriage as you designed it to be, but we would have this great blessing of knowing that through our marriages, Christ and his love for his people is being proclaimed, as it has been since you created marriage at the very beginning. So use your word this morning to speak to us. We've, we've perhaps heard Numerous sermons on these verses. Let us hear them this morning with fresh ears and with a renewed, desi- renewed desire in our hearts to apply them in our lives. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, God created us to be emotional beings. And emotions are wonderful things. They can be a little difficult to handle sometimes, but they're wonderful things. I thought Pixar did an outstanding job in depicting how important our emotions are in the movie Inside Out. Not just the, it's not just the positive and happy emotions that are needed, right? We can't always be happy in life. And sadness is often what connects us to families, to difficult events, friendships, and learning how to have empathy for others when they face difficult times. You know, as, as integral as our emotions are, It's never a good idea to let ourselves be governed by them. Helpful analogy to help us understand the role of emotions in our life is that of a train. With a train, you have the engine on one end, you have the caboose on the other. And emotions are like the caboose. They have an important function, but the caboose is not supposed to drive the train. That's what what the engine is for. The engine is our thoughts and our attitudes. And and the best fuel for godly thoughts and attitudes is God's truth. So a mind that is thinking and dwelling on God's Word can bring along godly emotions and behavior right with it. So with, with that in mind, let me ask you, how is your attitude towards your spouse if you're married? Are you ashamed at all with the thought that God knows how you feel and act towards them outside of this place here? Your thoughts help form and determine how you feel about your spouse as well as how you feel about married and being married in general. And, and your thoughts, they can inspire hope in you or they can take it away. And if you know how you feel and act towards your spouse are not what they should be, 
then you need to repent. You need to change the way you think. You need to get the train of your thoughts going in a different direction. And the good news is that when your thoughts change, the rest of the train, your behaviors and your feelings, they follow right along with it. Well, here's what the Apostle Paul says about changing your thoughts and your actions. And he says this in Romans 12. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, which the first 11 chapters have been talking about in the book of Romans, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, don't don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think so as to have sound judgment. See, if your thoughts about marriage and about your spouse, if they need to be transformed, and you know if they do need to be that way, it could be because you think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And as a result, because your thinking is off, your judgments are off, your perceptions are off, your beliefs and your conclusions and your attitudes about your spouse, they're not sound. They're skewed. Paul said your, your mind needs to be remo- renewed so that you don't go on thinking like the world thinks. You need to think according to God's truth. And you need God's truth to help have God-glorifying attitudes which will lead to God-glorifying behaviors in your marriage which will lead to greater peace, intimacy, and oneness with your spouse. Now, does this sound like your marriage? Or does it sound like something that you hope your marriage could become? Do Do you desire a marriage that will satisfy you, that will bring you the joy that you long for? Do you desire a marriage through which Christ will be exalted? I want to assure you this morning that such a marriage is possible. It can happen when husbands and wives embrace their God-ordained roles and exercise God-glorifying attitudes by the power of God's indwelling Spirit. So this is our third and our final message on Christ-exalting roles in marriage. And this morning, I'm going to start by looking at the God-glorifying attitudes in marriage, the attitudes of love and respect. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to start right off determining something. We need to determine to exercise God-glorifying attitudes. And the God-glorifying attitudes that you need to determine to exercise, they are a product of of your walk with God. Now let's let's briefly review what we've covered so far that we can see so we can see how this is true. See, Paul commands us back in verse 18, he says be filled with the spirit. And those under the spirit's control, they produce four common characteristics: fellowship, worship, gratitude, and then in verse 21, submission. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So this verse, it serves to transition into Paul's instructions regarding marriage. But the particular instructions that Paul gives to husbands and wives, it's governed by this Christ-fearing pattern of mutual submission that applies to everyone who's here this morning and who professes to be a follower of Christ, regardless if you're married or not. So being subject to one another in the fear of Christ, it is a characteristic of godly men and women. And we all must desire to establish this Christ-fearing pattern in our lives and especially in our marriages. Now those who determine determine to exercise God-glorifying attitudes in marriage, they also are those who decide to embrace their God-ordained role in marriage. Paul says, the husband is the head of the wife in verse 23. So husbands, your role is that of being the head. So God has given man the responsibility to lead his wife. And sinful men through the ages, up until today, they've taken this responsibility and they've selfishly warped it into something that serves only them 
So biblical headship, it's not a command from God for men to rule over women or husbands to rule over their wives as a means to satisfy themselves or permission to be a little tyrant in your home or, or the one who makes every decision in your home. That's not what biblical headship is. It's the responsibility of a husband to lead and to care for his wife and children in a way that honors and resembles Christ's care for him. He's to lead diligently, unselfishly, constantly, biblically, wisely, patiently, fearfully, and appreciatively. And under such leadership men, God would have your wife to feel cherished, valued, respected, honored, served, heard, and safe. Now, speaking to wives, Paul commands wives in verse 22. He says, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Every passage in the New Testament that deals with the relationship of the wife to her husband tells her to submit to him using the word, the the Greek verb, hupatasso. And he uses it in a passive verse, voice, and it makes it something that she is to choose to do. So Paul's command for wives to be subject themselves to their husbands is made without any suggestion of their inferiority or of the husband's superiority. Submission is something that is expected of all mankind, not just women. A woman does not submit to a man because she's a woman. A wife should submit herself to her husband because God made her his, him, her head. A submissive woman is not a passive woman. She has the the responsibility to lovingly confront any of her husband's sinful ways. Submissive wives are not doormats. They are courageous women who trust confidently in God's sovereign care for them. They submit to their husbands affirmingly, obediently, and comprehensively, leading to their husbands feeling encouraged, supported, empowered, trusted, and valued. Now the commands that Paul gives, they reflect the God-glorifying attitudes that husbands and wives need to have in marriage. And these commands are directed to each of us in our respective weaknesses, meaning that, that Paul is telling each of us things that we need to do that we might not do unless we're told. Husbands are told in verse 25, love your wives. Because it's easy for husbands not to love their wives. Wives are told to respect their husbands. Why? Because it's easy for wives not to respect their husbands. And so it's important to understand that these are things that we are not naturally inclined to do. Therefore, what? We must, by the Spirit's power, determine to do them. You've got to be walking with God, men, women, if you're going to carry these things out. You disconnect yourself from God, you're not going to do what you're not, what you're not inclined to do. So these respective commands, they also reveal something about our basic needs as husbands and wives. A husband needs to be respected. A wife needs to be loved. So God's command, when He commands one spouse to give to the other what that spouse needs... And men, are, men and women, they're like two different kinds of cars. Right? They run on different kinds of fuel. Men run on respect. Women run on love. It's not that women don't need respect. I mean, Aretha told us that, right? And it's not that men don't need love. Julio Glacius can tell us that, right? Everyone desires both of these things, love and respect. So, but what Paul is doing here is he, he's singling out these two duties so that we will be very careful to remember that if the marriage is going to be the wonderful and satisfying relationship that God has designed it to be, a husband needs to be respected by his wife and a wife needs to be loved by her husband. So with this in mind, husbands... 
Paul tells you the God-glorifying attitude you are to have in your role as the head. In verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives. In verse 28, he says, Husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. And then a third time in verse 33, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself. In fact, in verses 25 to 33, Paul uses the word love no less than six times. Men, God doesn't command you to be the head of your wife. That's just something that you are. Instead, He commands you, not once, not twice, three times, love your wife. And His command, it, 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 it's explained by referencing Christ's love for His church and by the way that you love your own body. So out of these two analogies, we gain this really clear understanding of how God expects us to love our wives. Paul says first that husbands are to love their wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now this by itself is an impossible task. Right? No husband can love his wife to such a depth and a degree as to how Christ has loved his bride. Think about the song that, that we love to sing Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. Rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. But the depth of the ocean, I mean, it can be measured. God's love, though, it's infinite. It's beyond measure. You will never plumb its depth. You will never measure the breadth of God's love. But your love for your wife, that should always be growing. We're never called to be satisfied with where our love is at. And this was Paul's desire for the Thessalonians. He said, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. Man, don't let, the complac don't let complacency set in in your marriage. Excel in your love for your wife. Biblical love is derived from God's love, which means that your love for others, your wife in particular, it will grow in proportion to your understanding of God's love for you in Christ. But what do we know about His love that helps us to see how we are to love our wives? Well, men, you are first of all to love your wives unconditionally. Love unconditionally. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrates His own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for us was not conditioned upon our obedience. He chose to love us when we were in rebellion against Him. So man, is your love for your wife conditional? Do you withhold your love when she doesn't please you or do what you want her to do? See, that's not how Christ's love, Christ loves you, is it? How, how dismal a life it would be for a Christian if we only knew God's love when we obeyed Him. His love for you is unconditional, and this is how you are to love your wife, unconditionally. You're also to love your wives volitionally, which may not be a word, but by which I mean you're to choose to love her. It's a choice that you make. And this is how God loves you. It was how He chose to love Israel. As He says in Deuteronomy 7, He says, The Lord did not set His love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you. See, God didn't love you because you were so wonderful, Christian, because you were so lovable. Remember, He loved you when you were in rebellion against Him. He loved you because He chose to. Marriage is a commitment that you make to love the woman that you, are mar you married at all times, through all seasons, in all circumstances, and until death. So don't base your love on how you feel. Don't let your emotions drive the train. Let godly thoughts take your emotions where they need to go. God expects you to choose to love your wife like He chose to love you. We're to love our wives personally. 
Because of his love for the church, he gave himself up for her, Paul says. Christ didn't expect others to sacrifice for his bride. No, he willingly offered himself to meet her needs. Men, can, you, can your wife think of things that she must do because you won't do them? There's many, there may be things that your wife is better at than you, maybe the finances or something like that, and so she does them. But, but if she told you that, that she preferred that you do them, would you? Would you make her feel guilty for doing that? Can your wife count on you to do, the, to do the things that you say that you will do? Or does your passivity about the things that concern her, does it tempt her to nag you, to feel uncared for? Perhaps one of the most neglected ways that you can give of yourself also happens to be one of the simplest. You can just tell your wife often that you love her. Some husbands treat the words, I love you, like fine pieces of china that you only bring out on special occasions. Or that, or, or that words that they have to say when their wife says, do you love me? The truth is, is, that, is that those words, they should be heard all the time around your house. Not just so that your wife can hear them, but so that your kids can hear you saying that to your wife. Whenever I show public displays of affection to Rosita in the house, the kids are like, I'm like, be quiet. We're giving you security. <laughs> They're getting older now. They don't squirm so much. They just go, please, please, don't do that. <laughs> your love for your wife is to be characterized by your doing the things that she that you know that she both needs and wants you to do, men. You're also to love your wives sacrificially. See, Christ loved you. He gave himself for you. He died, the just for the unjust, to bring you to God. In love, he endured the horrible death of the cross with all its physical and spiritual torture and agony. In love, he bore the guilt and the penalty of your sin and the wrath of God in your place. In love, He personally bore your sins in His own body on the cross so that the penalty and the power and devastating effects of sin in your life might be broken. And while your love will fall short of Christ's, a growing grasp of what He has done for you, it will give you a constant encouragement and measure for your love for your wife. Christ's giving of himself was for the benefit of his bride. He gave himself up for her. And in the same way, men, your self-giving should be for the benefit of your wife. You are to love her preferentially. That's the, uh, there's the story of a man who, who bought his wife a shotgun for her birthday. And so to return the favor on his birthday, she bought herself a string of pearls, really nice string of pearls, right? We don't want to be that way. We don't want to buy ourselves gifts for our wives. We want to love our wives preferentially. See, your wife has a variety of needs, and those needs are physical, emotional, intellectual, social, recreational, sexual, and spiritual needs. You're not loving your wife preferentially if you are only concerned about where your needs and and her needs intersect if that's the only place you're looking well we both like this so we can do that that's that's not loving her preferentially that's great that you're at least looking there and and you'll certainly capitalize on pursuing those interests together but you need to be concerned about all her needs And the best way for you to know if you are loving your wife preferentially is to ask her. That alone may speak volumes to her that you actually are asking her such questions. Are there things that you'd like to do that we don't do? So your goal should be that your wife feels that that she can bring her needs to you and she knows that you will hear her and you'll take them to heart. So Paul repeats his insistence on the husbands, on, on husbands loving 
their wives by restating his charge again down in verse 28. But this time he, he puts it in, in terms of loving his wife as he loves himself. But, but we want to make sure that we understand how Paul does this because when we do, it's going to impact us the way he intends it to. So as Christians, we know that God desires his people to love their neighbors as themselves, right? And I think Paul certainly has this in mind. He, he's got Leviticus 19 in mind by saying that the husband who loves his own wife loves himself. But see, Paul doesn't stop there. He says husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. And so it would appear that, that Paul is going back even further than Leviticus. He's going back to Genesis 2.24 where God described marriage as a couple becoming one flesh which you'll note in verse 31, he quotes Genesis 2.24. But at the same time, by using the word body and not flesh, he, he's tying in the analogy of Christ and the church. Since he already has, uh, he's already referred to the church as the body of Christ in verse 23 and again in verse 30. And so when we put all this together, in, in this command for husbands to love their own wives as their own bodies, Paul is applying the general command of Leviticus 19.18 to love your neighbor as yourself, effectively saying that you have no closer neighbor than your wife, the one who's living in your house, the one who's sleeping next to you in your bed. And according to God's design for marriage, you are one flesh with her. So loving her is loving your own body. And this is exactly the example that we have in Christ who loved the church and gave himself up for her who is his body. So what Paul has done here is masterful. It's actually more than masterful. It's, it's inspiration. This is the inspiration of God's Spirit to cause Paul to link together his mandate for marriage in Genesis his commandment in Leviticus that transcends all cultures and we know as the golden rule, and then to link it also with the redemption of his people through the death of Christ so that husbands will understand not just how important a husband's love is in marriage, but how fundamental it is to Christianity itself. Your love for your wife, husbands, is fundamental to Christianity. And knowing this, it should impact you. In designing marriage as he has, God has invested in you, the husband, a very significant gospel opportunity. And I do mean opportunity because just knowing this might not have the effect on the type of husband that you choose to be. And that would be, in a word, regrettable. But there's also the chance that knowing this could fill you with a fear of God. A fear that you have lacked. And with it, the motivation that you have needed to love your wife as God intends. Now, how will knowing this shape the way you love your wife? Well, Paul says in verse 29, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. So this word, cherishes, Literally means to keep warm, figuratively, to cherish, to comfort. Paul used this same word one other time when he spoke of his love for the believers in Thessalonia. He writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.7, he says, We prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. That's the word he's using here, tenderly. Man, the picture that Paul is painting here is that because you love your wife, you will give your life for her good. You will express your love by nourishing and cherishing her who is your beloved. Men, love your wives tenderly. Love tenderly. Regardless of how you may have been up to this point, decide this day to be the end, for it to be the end of, of jokes that are at her expense, cutting remarks about her, especially before others. If she makes a mistake, and by before others, I mean friends, I mean family, I mean children. Never cut your wife down in front of others. That's not tender, cherishing love. 
if she makes a mistake, if she misspeaks or does something wrong that makes her look foolish to others, don't capitalize on that moment. Don't join in making her look bad, but instead, if it's necessary, speak to her privately, but only if it's needful. You don't need to bring it up. Choose to be a gentleman. Speak to her courteously, politely, at all times. I can count on no hands how many times my wife has appreciated me being sarcastic with her. Never speak harshly to her. Never use coarse language with her. Show her how valuable she is to you by how you treat her. And lastly, men, love your wives pleasantly. See, right after telling us that a husband who loves his own, his wife loves himself, Paul adds this in verse 21, 29. He says, no one ever hated his own flesh. We don't hate ourselves. We may not like certain things about ourselves, but we don't hate ourselves. We don't treat ourselves poorly. Quite the contrary, we love ourselves. Right? When we're, when we're hungry, we eat. Amazing how easy it is for me to be driving down the street going, oh, I'm kind of hungry, I think I'll pull in there. And my kids say, hey, can we go there? No. Nope, not spending money on that. We clothe ourselves when we're cold. We treat ourselves to dessert. We long to be loved by someone. Why? Because it feels good. We don't hate ourselves. We don't hate our own flesh. We nourish and we cherish it. What's Paul's point? Well, Paul was pretty clear about it when he wrote to the Colossians, right? Here he says, no one ever hated his own flesh in Ephesians, but to the Colossians he put it real clear. Don't be harsh with them. Men, don't be harsh with your wife. In so doing, Paul is emphasizing that the headship of the husband and his love for his wife it must not be negative. It must not be oppressive or reactionary. Are you impatient with your wife? Do you give yourself grace to be late that you don't give to your wife? Does, ask your wife this question. Does she fear displeasing you because she knows that she's going to pay for it later from you? You're going to be angry with her. You need to stop being harsh with her. You need to choose to love pleasantly. Yours must be a headship of love, treating her with patience and grace. Why? Because she's a fellow heir of the grace of life. She is someone who is equal to you, who voluntarily, out of love, chooses to submit to your authority. That's why you should not be harsh with her, but you should be pleasant. You're no better than her. And yet she voluntarily submits to you. And you're the head of your wife as Christ is the head of the church. And so like Christ, lead her in love. Love her unconditionally, volitionally, personally, sacrificially, preferentially, tenderly, and pleasantly because this is how Christ loves you. So we turn from the husband's God-glorifying attitude of love to the wife. The wife's God-glorifying attitude of respect for her husband. So Paul's exhortation to wives is in verse 33. The wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So this is the Greek word phobos, means fear. And Paul is using it to convey a wife's need to treat her husband's leadership with appropriate regard and deference. And this means, ladies, that the respect that God is calling for here, it's not connected to your estimation of how worthy He is of your respect. It is connected to, your, to the role that God has put Him in, which is your head. So God made Him your head when you married Him. You married Him, He's your head. If you said, I do, then you're in. He's your head. So God says you need to respect Him. 
Now, you should, you should see this concluding exhortation here to wives, right? It's at, the, it's at the end. It's kind of summing things up. But don't disconnect it from what he says in verse 22. I think the two are linked. In verse 22, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. So Paul is saying to wives, Subject yourselves to your husbands in everything and hold him in high esteem because of his position as head over you. Of course, you desire to respect him as well because of his godly character, right? Who wouldn't want to respect him for that? Your desire to respect him um, would be made all the more easier and gratifying if he had godly character. And looking out, I, I would say most of you are blessed with just such a husband. But make no mistake, your respect cannot be contingent upon that. God calls you first to respect your husband dutifully. Respect dutifully. The respect asked for of a wife, it recognizes the God-given character of the headship of her husband and being the godly woman that you are, you choose to treat your husband with loving regard and deference. Now practically speaking, ladies, refuse to paint your husband in a bad light before others. Proverbs 14.1 says that the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. So Solomon's point is that a wife has the ability to tear her home apart with her words if she so chooses. Ladies, your husband has many shortcomings. He has many failings. His poor dis- he, he, uh he may have poor decision-making abilities, and that includes um, the times when he does things that he thought would work out, and they crashed and burned. You know about all of them. You get a front-row seat to most of these things. Don't share his shortcomings. Don't share his failings. Don't share his poor decision-making with anyone, and that includes working it into a prayer request. See, this type of public disrespect only encourages others to think less of him and maybe even less of yourself also. And not only should you refrain from being disrespectful towards your husband in public, but don't be disrespectful in private either. Don't talk to your husband in a rude, condescending, or mean tone. You know, as disappointed as you may be in him at times, Temper your dissatisfaction by reminding yourself that not only is he in need of God's sanctifying work, but so are you. The fact that you're willing to blast him, that's evidence right there. We all fail. And while failure certainly needs to be addressed, remember, you are not called to be his heckler. You're called to be his helper. And this is why you need to be walking closely with the Holy Spirit because He's the one who produces the self-control that you need for your words and for your tone. Proverbs 16.24 says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Remember, ladies, that, that you're venting to others and your angry and condescending words to your husband, they are sinful. It's easy to think that they deserve to be said. But but the truth is they will accomplish nothing of good for your husband. Instead, choose to protect your husband's reputation. And if you must complain to someone, God is ready to listen. Don't come complain to me. God is ready to listen. In fact, not only does he understand your husband better than anyone else, but he has the love and the power and the wisdom to change your husband. Now, just as the Lord calls on husbands to display their headship through likeness to Christ's headship over his church, so now wives are asked to render their submission in a way that is most like that of the willing submission of the church to Christ. But we also have an example in Christ himself because Christ was thoroughly submitted to the Father. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. It's his food. It's my daily sustenance. I think about food all the time. Christ thought about pleasing his father all the time. 
How did he serve his father? Begrudgingly? Unwillingly? Stoically? No. He served the father with gladness, without fear and without regret. He trusted his father, um, and, and though he was co-equal with him, he respected his authority. That was his role. And he delighted to do the father's will. In other words, ladies, you need to respect your husband freely. Respect freely. Respect him voluntarily from the heart. And this means, ladies, that that God cares as much about what you do as the attitude with which you're doing it. You may be thinking, you know, it would be far easier to respectfully submit to my husband if he was more like God the Father. I mean, at least Jesus had that going for him. God is perfect in every way, and and you... Yet you still have trouble submitting to him, don't you? So let's agree that the problem isn't just the husband. But whether your husband is a jerk or the sweetest man on the earth, wives, Paul says the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. In other words, do it. Respect is not something that you give him in return for loving behavior. It is something that you freely give him because God wants you to. He wants wants you to show your husband respect whether or not your husband is loving you the way you think that he should. And if that is your situation more often than, than you'd like it to be, then understand that God knows that too. He sees you. He sees your situation. He knows the husband he gave you. He knows that he can be rude or condescending, or forgetful, or selfish, or demeaning, or demanding, or overbearing. He knows all that. And yet, that command still remains written on the pages of your Bible. And that that footnote that you wrote on verse 43, unless you're married to my husband, that doesn't count. That's not inspired. Ladies, God knows what He's doing. He knew what he was, he was going to do back when you said, I do, or I will. He has a plan, and it's, it's probably way different than what you think it should be. And if you're waiting until you feel like respecting your husband, you're going to be waiting for a very long time. Take your eyes off of how undeserving that you may think he is, and instead look at God and trust that he knows what he's doing. He wants you to focus on obeying Him. Despite your best efforts, ladies, you can't change your husband. But see, God can. And in fact, He wants to. And you need to understand something. You need to understand that God doesn't need your advice on how to change your husband. What He needs is your trust in Him and your obedience to Him. Listen to what uh, Peter said to wives. You're familiar with this text, but listen to it again. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way in former times the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now don't misread what Peter says here about without a word or chaste and respectful behavior. He's not saying that all women should be quiet and subdued. Because Peter's not talking about personality here. He's talking about a woman who obeys and reverences God and therefore her husband. See, if you're, if you're a laughing out loud kind of a girl, stay that way. Right? God's not talking about that. Godliness comes in many, in many shapes and sizes and molds and volumes. Godliness flows out of your trust in God. Your trust that He loves you. Your trust that He knows what He's doing. And so, so women, be the, be the woman 
that first caught your husband's eye back when you were dating, caused, caused him to separate you from all the other candidates. And you're thinking, he didn't have any other candidates. He's lucky. Lucky he got me. It was you and how you were that drew him like a tractor beam in. So, so don't change what caused you to stand out to him. And stop trying to change the things that you don't like about your husband. Instead, like Sarah, entrust yourself to God who loves you, who cares for you, who sees your confident and quiet trust in Him as a beautiful and a precious thing. And as you get out of the way, and as you focus on what God calls you to do, freely respecting your husband, Peter says, you've got nothing to fear. I'm in charge here. I'll take over. Stop withholding your respect. Give it freely so that God has from you what He will use to do all that He plans to do with your husband. Okay, I said that carefully. All that He plans to do. There's bound to be things that you wish God would change that God isn't going to touch. Not until He's in heaven. God knows what He, want to work, what he wants to work on. But you're an integral part, women. Respect your husband freely. So this is your role, ladies. Will you accept that God assigned this to you? Until you can do that, you'll never lastly respect gratefully. Respect gratefully. See, you, you will withhold all the things that God made your husband to get from you. Things that will make him a better man. Things that will make him a better leader, a better father, a better friend, and yes, a better husband. See, until you're ready to respect gratefully, you'll withhold those things that he needs to be what you want him to be. So stop waiting until you feel like respecting your husband. The way you feel about people is influenced by how the way that you treat them, the way you talk about them, and as we said at the beginning, the way you think about them. And so if you want to feel respectful to your husband, then start with your thoughts and your actions first. Stop focusing on his failures and on his shortcomings and start listing those things about him that you admire and appreciate. Choose to dwell on those thoughts so you'll respect him gratefully. Now every husband will feel respected in a slightly different way. right? So, so what works for one husband, it may not work for yours, but, but here are some things that you might consider. I polled thousands of men on these things in my free time this week. And I compiled this list for you. And the reason that your husband will probably like some of these is because they convey respect. Here's what you can do, ladies. You can compliment him. You can show your appreciation for things that he does. You can do things his way without a fight. You can ask for his opinion or advice. Except on clothes, we're not good on that one. We just say, looks good. Can we go now? Focus on the positive. Build him up in front of others. And even if he's not around, be intimate with him. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Speak in a loving tone. Treat him as an equal, not a child. Back him up in front of the children. Avoid nagging and complaining. Pick up things he likes at the grocery store. Beloved, if you will desire to establish the Christ-fearing pattern in marriage of mutual submission. If you will decide to embrace your God-ordained role in marriage, husbands as the head, wives as submitting to them, if you will determine to exercise God-glorifying attitudes in marriage of love and respect, then God says that there's one thing left to do. Delight to exhibit the Christ-exalting purpose of marriage. Delight to exhibit the Christ-exalting purpose of marriage. See, we, we can't conclude without calling attention to one last remarkable aspect of marriage. Paul points us back to Genesis where God established marriage. And in verse 31, he quotes verse 24, chapter 2, verse 24, saying, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he gives this interpretation, Paul does, of that verse to show God's purpose in marriage. He says, this mystery is great. 
I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So your marriage is a living parable of the relationship between Christ and his church. Since the beginning of man, God placed in every culture and in every age a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church that would one day come about with man. And this is God's purpose for your marriage. This also means that, that what we have been speaking about here, headship, submission, love, respect, this is not accidental. This is not temporary. This is not culturally determined. It is a part of the essence of marriage as God designed it. These things are essential elements to God's original plan for a perfect, sinless, harmonious marriage in which three things are on display. First, a glorious bride. Husbands, God intends your loving leadership to sanctify and beautify your wife. Just as Christ's goal is a spotless church washed clean with the water of the word men, God's goal is to use your tender and gracious care for your wife to grow to her in godliness and in beauty. She should be a more beautiful woman as a result of being married to you. And as God is making you a glorious bride, through you God is making women a grateful groom. We have a glorious bride and we have a grateful groom. Proverbs 18.20 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 12.4 says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. And then together, this glorious bride and this grateful groom, they present a gospel picture that God placed in the world at creation and in every generation since that testifies of the relationship that God will have with His people. See, a marriage will exalt Christ and it will satisfy sinners as husbands and wives embrace their God-ordained roles and exercise God-glorifying attitudes by the power of God's indwelling Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you because many of us need to repent this morning for having not been compliant with your will. We've not wanted to do what you have called us to do as husbands and as wives. There are men here who have been poor heads, poor leaders. They have not loved their wives as you have loved the church. There, have been, there are women here who have refused to submit to their husbands in everything. They have withheld the respect that, that not, not that he deserves from his, who he is, but what he is, her head. And all of these things grieve you because you made marriage to picture the relationship between your son and his bride, the church. And one day that's going to be for everyone to see and enjoy. But for right now, it's to be glimpsed in every marriage, especially those between Christians. So forgive us, Father, please. We ask your forgiveness for having having refused to obey you. We turn away from our sin this morning back to you and ask for the grace and for the help to do what you have shown us clearly from your word that we need to do. Let there be change today. In in every home here, let there be something that a husband and a wife are now working on so that they would be satisfied, yes, but more importantly, you would be glorified through this. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
me to